Amen. All right, you guys ready for tonight's mystery story? Yay, all right, that's right. Here's the, here it comes, here it goes. Uh, you would think that saving these people from a horrible abuse of oppression where they were beaten and worked to death like dogs would have been enough. But no, 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 not these people. And then you would think that a miraculous rescue and, and a total destruction of their enemies would have changed their not, minds. But no, Tom, not these people, no sirree. Every single one of them seemed to whine and complain, whine and complain. They were totally ungrateful. First, it was the water, right? They needed some water, okay? So God provided that, but that wasn't good enough. Then they wanted some food, so God provided for that, but that still wasn't good enough. Then they started to whine and complain about the path they were on, saying it was too hard. They didn't like it. It's it's not comfortable. They, They decided to take it out on the leadership, and they said this, if only we had died. If only we had died where we came from. And I mean, there we sat around these pots of meat and we ate all the food that we wanted. In fact, man, we remember the good times, the, all the fish we ate and the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic and the chicken. Who said that? Oh, you get our first piece of gum tonight, man. Praise God, Peggy. You, that's awesome. You must be related to Ruth. But anyway, let's move on. I digress. Uh, but now, they said... <laughs> But now we've lost our appetite and, and we never see anything but this food from God. Yeah. Well, this the leadership simply stated, you guys have no clue what you're doing, man. The Lord, he's heard you're grumbling all right. Who are we that you should grumble against us? You're not grumbling against us. You're grumbling against God. And boy, were they right. When the Lord heard these people whining and complaining about how he provided for them, he became exceedingly angry. So much so that he released a fire upon them and they began to burn to a crisp. And yet, once again, in an amazing act of humility, the leadership that once again had been spurned by the people prayed to the Lord on behalf of these people. And sure enough, the fire began to die down, but not before scores of whining and complaining people paid the price for their horrible ungratefulness. The books, of course, are the books of Exodus and Numbers, and the judgment, of course, is on the whiny, complaining Israelites. Wow. Now, folks, uh, I don't think you have to go to Bible college to figure this out, but how many guys would say, based on this text, that God is not a very big fan of whining and complaining about his provision, right? And we're always grateful for whatever he does. Yeah, but anyway, here's the point. This passage tells us, folks, believe it or not, okay, that God does not mess around with sin, not even the sin of complaining or whining and being ungrateful for what he's done for us, okay? See, we want to categorize sin and say, well, that was a small one or a white lie as opposed to a... Whoa, God doesn't play that game. Sin is sin. And the message throughout the scripture, Old and New Testament, is sooner or later, bang, the hammer's coming down and God's going to judge that sin. And so the point is, folks, that's what we get again from this account. You would think then when God warns us in the scripture of another coming future judgment that we stand up and take notice, right? You think the logical conclusion then is based on the character and consistency of God and what he feels about and does towards sin ultimately is that we'd say, hey, I better get right with God so I don't suffer this coming future judgment of God, right? Now, what's the problem? I've been seen for weeks and weeks and weeks. The God of this world, Satan, the little G, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe with evolution. And so because of that, our world today not only has a problem, if you will, believing in God, But if there's one thing they adamantly refuse to believe in is that God is a God who would judge sin. But folks, throughout the scripture, he's very clear. He judged this world once, he's going to do it again, and people need to get ready, scoffing or not. And that's why we're going to continue in our study, the witness of creation. And you know the theme, what we're doing is we're taking a look at different evidences that God's left behind for us to show us he's not just real, but we really can have the good news, an intimate, loving, personal relationship with God, the creator of the universe, through Jesus Christ, before it's too late. Because if you take your last breath here and you still haven't said yes to Jesus, you're going to hell. You're going to be judged, okay? But you can escape that judgment through Jesus Christ. Now, we've seen that incredible evidence he's given us of this fantastic message that was just stated, and that's through a couple different ways. We've already seen with an intelligent creation or 10 weeks on intelligent design. The second evidence he's shown us this truth was the evidence of a young creation. We have not been here for millions and billions of years. That's a lie that evolution needs, but it's not true, okay? that uh, we've been here that long. The third one was the evidence of a special creation. We did not come from the goo to the zoo to me and you. We came from God for a special purpose to have a special relationship with a special creator. And then the last six times, the fourth evidence was the evidence of a judge creation. Okay, and what we've been seeing, there's tons of evidence all over the world that God really did judge this world once and he's gonna do it again. Okay, and that's what we saw even last time with the evidence 
of the thing that people have a problem with or skeptical towards, and that is the issue of a gargantuan boat, okay? Was there really this guy, Noah, with eight people, his family and they all together, did they really build this big old giant boat? And we saw, yeah. And not just because the Bible says so, not that that's bad, right? That's our starting source. It's where it should be, okay? But because of our skeptical society, it's forced us to go ahead and do our homework and look outside. And we saw there's tons of evidence that this boat existed. All throughout culture we saw last time, and not just in recent times, but even in past times prior to the first coming of Jesus, people in history were recording, seeing the ark, going to the ark, taking stuff from the ark, etc. It's written down for us if you take a look at the annals of history. But we also took a look also at the feasibility of the ark. Okay? And that thing, modern, as we saw last uh, uh, week, uh, put it with computer generation models with the dimensions the Bible gives us, oceanographers today, they put it to the test. And that book was, uh, the boat was completely seaworthy, okay? Just like an ocean liner today, okay? Specific dimensions given to us by God, okay? And then we saw some of the issues of the space requirements, okay? God put in a couple of limiting factors, okay, with the boat there. Noah didn't have to bring two of every uh, uh, two of every kind of uh, species of animal, right? Okay, as the skeptic would say, it was two of every kind, so that limits the number, right? You don't need all the dogs, you just two of the dog kind, one male, one female, right? And also, we saw another limiting factor was it was just the air-breathing land animals that he needed to bring on the ark. He didn't need to bring all the aquatic ones, okay? They're fine outside, okay? So you put that together, and that seriously, seriously reduces the number, okay? And that's where it brings us tonight. That's where we left off last week, okay? you still put in those limiting factors that we see in the scripture, okay, that's still a lot of animals uh, to put in that boat, right? With Noah and his family, right? And so based according to the scripture, do we have any uh, ability to check out and see if there was in fact enough uh, room in that boat to get all these critters in there? Yeah, you just read the Bible, break out your calculator, and there was room to spare, okay? But again, don't take my word for it. Let's listen to God. So open your Bibles to Genesis. And let's go back to that account that gives us the exact dimensions of the ark, and let's do some math. Genesis chapter 6, was there enough room to hold all the two of every kind of air-breathing land animal? Genesis chapter 6, verse 13 through 17, let's take a look at that account again, okay? And uh, verse 13 says this, so God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people. How many people? All people. That's a whole planet. We're going to see, Lord willing, later this was not a local flood. All means all. The whole earth means the whole earth, okay? But anyway, so all people is what he says on the earth, okay? Uh, and he's going to put a, 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 an end to all the people on the earth there. And he says, because the earth is filled with violence because of them. And I'm surely going to destroy both them and uh, the earth. So make for yourself, Noah, an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it, okay? And coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you're to build it. The ark is to be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. Make a roof for it and finish the ark within 18 inches of the top. Put a door in the side of the ark and make a lower, middle, and upper decks. And I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has the breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. Why? What's the context of God doing this? Because of sin, right? How many guys would say that when everything on the earth is going to perish, save in this boat, uh, God takes sin kind of serious? Okay, he's judging it, okay? And that's the constant theme that's here. But what we see in this passage, as we saw last week, God gives us the exact dimensions for building the ark. Now, nothing in the scripture is by chance, right? He doesn't just estimate, yeah, it was a pretty big boat, and just moves on. God, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, okay, uh, through Moses, okay, wrote down, recorded for us the exact dimensions of the ark. Okay, and this is what we see here, okay? It's a triple decker. It's made out of a certain kind of wood. It's 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. And so let's do the math tonight. Is this, based on these exact dimensions from God, is this enough room to house all of the animals, two of every kind of air-breathing land animals? Yeah. And there's a bunch of room to spare. This is wild. When you finally stop being a skeptic, like I used to be, and you take the Bible face value, which is being honest, you want to be a seeker of the truth, you put it to the test, folks, and there's room to spare. I mean, tons of room. Let's take a look at the space requirements. First of all, the ark was not a ship with sloping sides, you know, bulging out. It was a large barge. Okay, it's like like a, a, you see oil tankers today? You know, just a square, giant rectangle, that's what it is. So therefore, it had a larger carrying capacity. It's maximized to carry, right? Nothing was wasted there. 
And so if you do the math with the dimensions given to us in the Bible, the ark would have had over 100,000 square feet of floor space, a total cubic volume of 1,518,000 cubic feet, which is equivalent to about 569 modern railroad stock cars. How many guys would say that you could hold a lot of stuff in 569 modern stock cars? How many guys wish that you had a modern stock car in your backyard to cram even more stuff that's stuck in your garage? To, right? Yeah. Well, imagine having 569 of them, right? That's how much you could hold in this ship, okay? Therefore, researchers say, listen, there was plenty of room for two of every kind of air-breathing land animal. In fact, you keep doing the math, there was room to spare. Researchers have discovered that on the high side, high side, no more than 35,000 individual animals need to go on the ark because the average size of animals is about the size of a sheep, right? This, uh, the church, we usually don't do ourselves any justice and help to the biblical account of Noah's flood when we want to depict in the kids' rooms and murals of the ark because we always pick these gigantic elephants, the giant giraffes. With their, most likely, that's not what was going on. First of all, the average size of the animal is, is about the size of a sheep. But number two, even the few large animals, like an elephant or even a dinosaur. Wait a second, Noah? Bringing a dinosaur on the ark? Was that a typo? No. Wait till you get to the next study, Lord willing. And start at 5,322. I don't know, it's coming someday. Uh, after this, when we're done with this study, we're going into what's going on with the dinosaurs, okay? Uh, according to the Bible, Genesis 6, God created all the land animals and people on day 6. So if he created all the land animals, uh, dinosaurs walked on land, and we haven't been here for millions and billions of years, what coexisted with man? According to the Bible, as crazy as it sounds, day 6, animals and dinosaurs and people. Do we have any evidence? Yeah, we're going to get into it. We're going to see human footprints, dinosaur tracks, crisscrossing. You're going to see right now today uh, that they find fresh dinosaur tissue, Tyrannosaurus. In fact, they just found one recently, Lord willing, we get to that, a triceratop, fresh tissue. And you know what happened to the guy who discovered it? They fired him. Oops, this just recently happened. Dinosaurs didn't die out millions of years ago. Dinosaurs got wiped out, most of them, as we'll see, 44, 4,500 years ago. That's why you can still have soft tissue. But anyway, I digress. So you get back here, so he's not going to bring the biggest giant animals, right? Noah's a smart guy. Obviously, he could figure out that you don't bring the fully-sized adult elephant, right? You bring the baby one. Why? Okay, it's, it's common sense, right? He's a smart guy. Uh, first of all, the baby ones, smaller ones, they're smaller. They eat less. They sleep more. And they live longer when they get off the ark to procreate, which is what you're bringing for in the first place, right? So that, you know, helps conserve the space as well. But so the average size is about the sheep, okay, no matter what the animal is. So researchers decide to pad the number anyway, okay, and be generous. So they, they assumed, okay, let's, let's crank it up to 50,000. Now, remember, on the high side, it's 35. But they're going to pad it anyway and use 50,000 as their number, 15,000 more than they need to. And so here's what they discovered, okay? Using the railroad cars for comparison, they know that the average double-deck stock car can accommodate about 240 sheep. Remember the average size of the animal, right? So if you do the math, that means that all the 50,000 animals, which again is 15,000 more than you really need, uh, can be carried only on 208 of the 569 railroad cars, which is only about 37% of the ark. That's all that they took up, the animal, 37%, okay, is that. And that would leave an additional 361 cars, or enough to make about five trains, each train carrying about 72 cars each, to carry all the food and the baggage, plus Noah's family of eight people, right? You got plenty of room if you do the math. In fact, you got plenty of room to spare, okay, as we're going to see in a little bit. So how many guys would say, if you're honest, and you take the exact dimensions, which I don't think is by chance, bust out your calculator, okay, you're going to see, and you're honest with the fact, that there's plenty enough of room on the ark. In fact, for people to still to this day say, you mean to tell me that he squished all those... What does that really tell you? You haven't done your homework. And if I just told you this and shared this math with you and the logical evidence with you, and you still back away and scoff and turn the other way, what are you doing? You're not an honest seeker of the truth. You're doing exactly what the Bible said you would do specifically in the last days on the account of the first judgment, the flood. You are being willingly ignorant. Nope, don't want to believe it. Don't confuse me with the fact. 
Okay? The second, or the next evidence we see that this uh, huge boat was uh, completely feasible, could really care uh, for all these animals, okay, is in fact the care requirement, okay? Because there's a second thing that's going on there. All right, so this thing, this boat, okay, really could hold two of every kind of air breathing land animal on the planet, right? We just established that, okay? But you got a secondary issue that's going on here. Wait a second. You got eight people, eight people taking care of 35 to 50,000 animals, okay? Is that really feasible? Yeah, it is, okay? And again, God thought of everything. Let's take a look at that evidence, okay? First of all, when it comes to caring for the animals, you got the air requirement, all right? This is very important, right? Put it all together, put it to the test. Many people say, well, how in the world did the animals breathe on the ark and not die, okay? And the reason why, and that is a good question, is because it's a similar problem to what modern mass animal farms have today, okay? You guys ever been tortured by seeing one of these things? I was growing up in the Midwest, right? Turkey farm or chicken farm, that's even worse. Okay, but they have a big problem. It's called ventilation, right? You got so many bodies crammed in there, generating heat, or you don't get enough oxygen, and they literally, you'll lose the whole herd of chickens. Not that that's bad, but I guess you call them a herd, don't you? I just call them evil. But anyway, that's right, I digress. Uh, so it's ventilation. That's your problem, okay? And so in these cramped conditions, you have to have adequate ventilation or the animals are going to die. So the question is, well, Noah's got a bunch, 35, 50,000 animals squishing this boat, right? There's room for it, but that's a lot. Well, how did they survive? Well, first of all, uh, the density of animals on the ark compared to the density of modern animal farms is considerably less. Remember, it only took up 37% of the space. Okay, but still, I'll give you that. Okay, if you read the Bible, the Bible tells us how God prepared for everything, even the air ventilation. Genesis 6, verse 16 says this, make a roof for it and finish the ark to within 18 inches to the top. And I like this picture because this is, you know, pretty accurate to what it would probably look like. According to the Bible, this design feature mentioned in the scripture would give, uh, acted as a series of windows all along the top center of the ark. Okay, there's your ventilation. Common sense tells us that since there was nothing to look outside the ark, these windows were not uh, for viewing, but for ventilation, right? They weren't put up there all along the ark for no one's family to go, hey, honey, look, come here, look, quick, quick. Water. Three months later, honey, look, you won't believe this. It's been three months, look. Water, right? It wasn't there for viewing, okay? He's not on a pleasure cruise. Okay, he's just trying to survive. These were put in there by God for ventilation. It's almost like God thought of everything. What a concept, okay? Then there's the food requirement. Uh-oh, let's think about that. Air is not the only thing the animals need. Obviously, they need food, right? Now, you don't need food, but you need a year supply. It wasn't in there just for 40 days, 40 nights. It was over a year. So you need a year's supply of food, not just for him uh, and his family, no one his family, but for the animals. So how do you provide? Well, first of all, again, read the Bible. The Bible gives us the answer. The Bible records that all the people and the animals were vegetarians before the time of the flood. After the flood, Genesis 9, when he gets off, God says, now you can eat meat. Prior to that, you have the vegetarian issue. And that's what we see in Genesis 1, 29 through 30. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth, and every tree that has fruit with seed in, they will be yours for what? Food. And to not just people, but what? To the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground. Everything that has the breath and life in it, I give every green plant for food. And you're thinking, what? Are you serious? You know, lions and tigers and eating vegetarian? Yeah. Remember we saw just a couple weeks ago in our study, why should we study Bible prophecy? Talking about the millennial characteristics. The lion and the ox are going to eat straw, okay? Part of the renovation in the millennial kingdom is God's going to renovate it back to the Garden of Eden-like conditions. And what we would consider wild animals who eat meat now, in the future, praise God, he might go out about that, they're going back to eating plants, not your leg, okay? But anyway, uh, let's move on. Uh, so therefore, based on what the scripture says, vegetarianism, okay, based on this point, the ark did not need to carry tons and tons and tons of bulky pounds of meat. Although I would appreciate that, me personally, but not in heaven. Uh, but rather, only small, dried foodstuffs, even concentrated foods, okay? So using this vegetarian issue as a guide, because that's what the Bible says, researchers have calculated that the total volume of foodstuffs on the ark would only have been about another 15% of the ark's total volume. So you had 37 to hold the animals, 15% to hold all the food. You still got plenty of room. In fact... Uh, the drinking water uh, would have taken up, they estimated, another 9.4% of 
which is still plenty enough room for everyone. Interesting. Now, you also have the waste requirements because after the animals eat the food, it just magically disappears. No, right? So that's another logical question, right? Because what's the skepticism say? Not just, is there enough room for the animals? Yes, there was. How did this guy and his family take care of them? That's a lot of animals. That's what we're looking at. Well, what about the waste? That's a good question. What did he do with all the waste products? That's a full-time job. Well, it's actually been estimated there may have been as much, listen, as 12 tons of waste products produced every single day on the ark. Another reason why you would appreciate having windows all up and down that baby. God thinks of everything, right? Fresh air. Okay, so the question is, okay, that's a lot. 12 tons a day. How do you do this? Remember, it's just eight people. Well, Noah was a smart guy. And uh, just like uh, smart folks today, you realize that uh, you need to work smarter, not harder, right? And he could very well use automated procedures that are not high tech, okay, that we even use today. For instance, he could have used something like this. He used sloped self-cleaning floors, right, uh, that we use today to empty manure into a gutter and then just dumps overboard, right? There's plenty enough water outside, and the EPA is nowhere in existence, don't have to worry about some government ticket, praise God. Okay, right? It could be automated. He's a smart guy. Okay, or he could have used composting methods, or he could have done what modern pet shops do today and let the waste go to the bottom of cages with bedding that only needs to be changed periodically, so you don't have to do it every day, you know? But you put all that together, either way, granted, it may not have been easy or comfortable or pleasant, but it's completely feasible. Remember, Noah, again, is not on a pleasure cruise. Okay, he's just trying to float. He's trying to survive right? Which actually I think is a good thing, okay? Uh, that he had to do this work, he and his family. Because again, they're in this boat for a year, right? I mean, anybody like playing Monopoly? Really? Oh, okay. You're, oh, it's okay. You can raise your hand. I'm not going to bite you. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so you're like, all right. Now, anybody enjoy winning at Monopoly, right? Anybody enjoy winning at Monopoly for a whole year, every single day, eight hours a day? You actually raised your hand. We'll pray for you later, Brian. I can't believe it. Okay, so most of us, other than Brian, uh, we get kind of bored at Monopoly eight hours a day, right? Canasta, man. How many times can you win it in Canasta and it's going to get old or, or play, you know, do you, so here's my point. Probably was a blessing as they're riding out this storm to have something to do with purpose on a boat for a year to pass the time away. Isn't it interesting? God thinks of everything. But then there's also the hibernation requirements. Okay, speaking of care, it's interesting to note that even though Noah and his family could care for all the animals, feed and removing their waste, we just saw that, but it could have even been even easier than what we just saw. And that's because when stormy weather hits, animals tend to hibernate. They sleep it out. Okay, this still happens today. And since the worldwide flood was the biggest storm ever, okay, this tells us most likely a lot of these animals on the ark would have hibernated, okay? And so that would have drastically reduced even the more amount of the constant care or even the food because most of them are probably hibernating. They're not going to eat. They're not going to create waste products and things of that nature. So, but either way, it was completely feasible uh, for him to do that. Okay, so once again, even though people want to say, hey, you know, the animal's getting fit. No, we, we, there's plenty of room for that. Oh, you mean to tell me that this guy, his family of eight people could take care of all? Yeah, very logical. Okay, could take care of that, not a problem at all, if you deal with the facts, okay? But that's not all. I mean, it seems when it comes to Noah's uh, ark uh, and the animals and surviving the flood, there's all kinds of skeptical questions. I think I know why, because again, what's the logical conclusion if there really was a guy who really had all these animals and his family of eight people survived on a worldwide flood for a whole year? What's the logical conclusion? Uh, the Bible's right, and then... You read the Bible and you see the purpose of the flood was to judge it because of sin. And then you keep reading the Bible over here and it says he's going to do it again. Uh, I better try to scoff at this ark thing, right? See, I think that's why, okay? But that's not all. They also scoff at not only just Noah himself, the boat, the feasibility of it, the animals, the care, and all that stuff. And we've answered all that. They come up with all kinds of questions surrounding the ark, okay? And I'm going to deal with a couple of them tonight, and then we're going to close, okay? And the first one that people say, you might have even heard this objection, and they'll say something like this, well, how in the world did Noah get all those animals on the ark, right? It's not just squishing them in there, how they even get there in the first place. 
And usually what they'll try to do, maybe you've encountered this, they'll try to paint this picture of Noah somehow renting a bunch of U-Hauls, if you will, or, or he's got to go down to Africa this week, Tom, and he's got to go get those lions, and he's got to hurry up and get on a plane, and he just got his tickets from Southwest, right? He's getting frequent flyer miles, by the way, all over the place. He's going over here, so he's got to get the drafts, and he's got to go way down to Australia and grab the kangaroos, and, and oh, no, the lions died by the time he got back, because it's been three months, and now he's got to go back down to Africa, and he's got to get these... And that's usually what they're, excuse me? Noah didn't have to get the animals. Read the Bible. God is the one who brought them to him. Genesis chapter 6, verse 20. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, and every kind of creature that moves along the ground will, what? Come to you and be kept alive. Now, okay, people, oh, you mean to tell me that God supernaturally caused the animals to come to, yeah. Okay. If God can cause a worldwide flood, and if God created the animals, and if God created the universe with the spoken word out of nothing, I think he could tell the animals to go over here and they're going to do it. Okay? I mean, just give me a break, okay? The second thing that they bring up, they'll say, oh yeah, speaking of the animals then, okay, so Noah didn't have to get them, God brought them to them, but how in the world did they get dispersed after the flood? Right? Now this actually is a good question. It's a logical question. Okay? And that's what they say. They say there's no way that th we can trust this account that all the animals, not just people, but all the animals had to restart after the flood. And because what they say is they say because we find certain animals that are characteristic to certain continents or areas or islands like kangaroos in Australia, and there's no way they could have got there uh, if this account was true. Okay? Uh, and, you know, they'll laugh. Oh, what do you mean to tell me that the kangaroos built a boat, you know? And off the tip of uh, Africa, or coming over around this direction over here in South America, and they floated over there and sailed over there, and no, okay. And this is the importance of once again modern technology, okay. What we see is modern technology is there's something that we can now see from the sky with satellite technology. It's called the continental shelf, okay. Now, if you take a look at what's going on with the continental shelf, and many scientists uh, believe that if you were to lower the level of the oceans just a little bit, it wouldn't take a lot. We're not talking thousands of feet or anything. Just a little bit, then all of a sudden, it would expose the continental shelf. And when the continental shelf exposes, you see that the ability for anybody, including animals, to traverse anywhere on the planet all of a sudden is there. There's, a, there's land bridges connecting all the current continents if you just lower the waters for a little bit. And a lot of scientists believe that this is what happened after the flood, okay? After the flood, because the atmospheric conditions, Lord willing, we'll get into that in a couple weeks, uh, but the atmospheric conditions drastically changed the atmosphere on the planet. One of the things that it induced after the flood was the ice age. There was an ice age, okay? But it did not happen millions of years ago or hundreds of thousands or tens of... No, it was induced for a short time after the flood, maybe a couple hundred years or whatever, okay? But there was an ice age. So, but and so the areas of land were exposed. They could travel wherever they wanted to on the earth, including Australia, right? But as the ice began to melt, the waters began to rise. So what we see today, which covered up the land bridge, the continental shelf, and that's why it appears that there's no way for these guys to get over there. The flood explains it all, okay? There's no need to scoff even about that. The next question they come up with is, they, oh, yeah? Well, okay, maybe there was this uh, Noah guy. Maybe he had all these animals. Maybe they were on a boat. Maybe he was able to take care of them. But I think that this flood was just a local flood. How many of you guys heard that? Okay, they just want to say, no, 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 this could not have been global. It's local. Now, what kills me, okay, is that this even comes from the church. Some Christians will teach this, okay, as if you need to somehow apologize or fix what God says. No, you don't. Man's a liar, not God. Okay, this was a completely global flood, okay? And, and this is yet what they say. They say, no, 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 it was local uh, because it's just kind of ridiculous to think that this thing uh, really did happen worldwide. No, okay? And it was local, the Bible's, or uh, global, the Bible's very emphatic about that. But what we're gonna see is there's tons of evidences, folks, why, in fact, this flood was indeed a global event. This was not something local, okay? First of all, you got the mountain problem. Let's put it to the test. The Bible clearly says that all the mountains under the entire what? Not just a portion of the heavens. The entire heavens were at least 20 feet underwater from the flood, right? 
common sense. Put that to the test. Therefore, how in the world could a flood cover the mountains of the Middle East? Because that's where they say it was. It was just a local flood in the Middle East, right? Uh, and yet not affect the rest of the world. That's absurd. Covering mountains means you cover them all, right? I mean, you picture it, right? If just, somehow you're going to say it's in the Middle East, and it was just a local flood, and it covered to the highest mountain, even there in the Middle East. It went over the mountain by 20 feet. Where's the water going to go? It's going to keep going. <laughs> it was some invisible wall, protective barrier, keeping it from going. Just crazy, okay? You got a serious problem with that, okay? Then you got the moving problem. This is common sense. If the flood were just local, why didn't God just tell Noah and his family to move? Right? And, and, and God warned them 120 years in advance. So even if you do the math, break out a calculator, even if they were crawling, they could make it to safety. Go to Japan. You'll be safe over there. Right? They could have still made it. Why, why, why did he say get into the boat? If it was just local, he could have just moved, okay? Or does common sense tell us the reason why he built the boat? was because the flood was indeed global, and there was no place to flee or crawl, okay? Then you got the animal problem. If the flood were local, then why did God send all the animals to the ark? Couldn't they have just moved out with Noah? Hey, we found some dry spots over here in Japan. There's plenty of room, right? That makes no sense of that either, if you're going to say it was local, okay? And again, does common sense tell us the reason why they were sent to the ark was to preserve them from death and extinction, just like God said was going to happen, okay? Then you got the death problem. The Bible clearly teaches that all the world's entire population of air-breathing land animals and people were going to die in this flood, okay? Yet if the Bible were local, then that means a massive amount of people who didn't live in the vicinity area would never have been affected by the flood and thus escape God's judgment, which is ridiculous according to the Scripture. It's completely contradictory. Yet the Bible clearly teaches all flesh perish with phrases like, Everything on earth or all living creatures of every kind on the earth. Notice it's the whole planet, okay? Or God saying, I am surely going to destroy both them, i.e. including people, and the earth. In fact, the global extent of the flood is referred more to than 30 type different times in Genesis 6 through 9 alone. Over and over again, God's very emphatic about it. Then you got the time problem. If the flood were just local, why in the world would Noah stay in the ark for over a year? 53 weeks is a long time to stay in a boat with a local flood. It ain't going to take that long to drain and see some dry land. If it's local, is he just self-torture with his family? Or is it a guy thing? You don't want to admit your mistake? All right, I know we built this thing, and we can get out. But we're going to stay in here for at least a year, get our money's worth. <laughs> right? You ever have a dad like that? Anyway, let's not digress. Right? This is crazy, right? Okay, if it was local. Or just common sense, tell us the reason why they stayed on that boat so long was because there was, in fact, no place to go. This wasn't local, this was a global flood. And it took that long to drain globally. Okay, that's why they were in there. Then there's the rainbow problem. The Bible clearly teaches God gave us the rainbow as a sign that he would never again flood the earth with a worldwide flood, right? Think about it. If the flood was just local, then this would make God a liar because we still have tons of local floods today. If you're paying attention, one, sometimes the skeptics make that mistake. Uh, God said he'd never flood the world. We have floods today. Well, and what's the appropriate response? Well, yeah, local flood, but God's promise with the rainbow was what? I'm never going to flood the whole thing. You don't get that if you want to compromise on this and say that it was just local. The Bible clearly says God doesn't lie. The flood he was talking about was global. And he uses even statements like this. Isaiah 54, 9 says, I swore, God speaking, that the waters of Noah would never again cover the what? The earth, okay? God is talking about a global flood, not a local one. And then there's the judgment problem. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3 that the future coming judgment by fire, remember the first time by water, second by fire, is going to be similar to the past judgment of water in Noah's flood, okay? But if the flood was just local, then does that mean that the final judgment by fire will also be local? Hmm? There he is again. Excuse me? That doesn't make sense. So only a portion of the earth gets... That doesn't make sense. And then, that's not all. If the Bible says we are going to look forward to the new heavens and the new earth after this judgment by fire, then and if it's just local, does that mean we're only going to look forward to a new local section of the heaven gets renovated? Or a new local section of the earth? The rest of it's all trash. But we get a new local... Hmm? One more time, Tom. That doesn't make sense. Or, one last time, can we safely assume 
just as the first judgment by water was indeed global, so it's going to be the same thing when the second coming judgment comes by fire. It's going to be the whole planet, right? God is going to burn this whole planet to a crisp, right? And, uh, and every environmentalist on the planet, with all due respect, is going to cry. You ain't going to save this planet. Nobody's going to save this planet. God is going to fry this planet. Right? Yeah, that is the next big bang and the next big global warming. It's going to be the global crisp. Okay. And you want to make sure that you're around for the new heavens and the new earth he's going to renovate. Okay? But here's the point, folks. The last, put all this together. The last two weeks, we've seen that there's been tons of sighting all over the world, okay, of Noah's Ark, that it really exists. We saw that when you base and do the math, that it is totally seaworthy. You do the math we saw tonight. There's plenty of space to hold all the animals. There's plenty of ability for Noah and his family, all eight of them, to take care of all the animals. It makes total perfect sense, okay? And so this is why there's no reason to scoff that there was a big, giant, gargantuan boat that really did survive a worldwide flood, right? God is, I believe, being merciful to us in these last days, giving us all this evidence to what? Not just say, yeah, there's a big boat. What's the whole premise with the boat? Why did they need a boat in the first place? God judged the world because of sin. So what's the logical conclusion? When he says he's going to do it again, and he has, we need to warn people just like Noah. Now that's the question we're going to leave off tonight, right? It's not enough to just go, aha, I can't wait for somebody to scoff at Noah. <laughs> I'm ready, right? No. The point is, yeah, we can be able to be armed and share the truth and the fact with him in love. But we're seeing a repeat today. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Noah's day was filled with great wickedness. What is our day filled with today? And so what Noah did when he saw all that wickedness, and he heard the news that God was going to judge the planet, what he did was he completely stocked up with survival gear and food, and he ran to the hills and lived in the cave until it happened. Oh, I'm sorry, wrong translation. That must be the Barney Bible with the purple cover. Don't read it. No, he was a preacher of righteousness, possibly for 120 years. So Noah knew what was coming. And yes, Noah was doing what God told him to do, and he was preaching for 120 years, most likely. Get in the boat. Get in the boat. And he was called a righteous man. Now, we're living in the same day. And Jesus Christ is coming back. We see the same level of wickedness as Noah's day. The question we have tonight is, are we going to respond like Noah did? Are we going to be preachers of righteousness? Are we going to run to the hills, only be concerned about us? Or are we going to be out there in love, letting people know you need to get into this piece of wood, the ark of Jesus Christ, the cross of Christ, before it's too late? Like this video here. We'll close after this. The stock market plummeted to record lows yesterday based on speculation. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth. The Lord saw that man's wickedness had become great, and that the thoughts of his heart dwelled only on evil. The earth was corrupt in God's sight and full of violence, for the people had corrupted their ways. The Lord regretted that he had made man, and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe my creation from the face of the earth men and animals, creatures that crawl on the ground and birds of the air, for I'm grieved that I have made them.
But one man found favor in the eyes of the Lord, one righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, who walked with God. This is the story of Noah. Every human impulse from Adam and Eve to Noah to Solomon to each one of us has been about grabbing everything we can get. We want riches and we want fame and we want glory and we want it now. We're humans and so we're bent towards evil and selfishness and violence. The path of Christ is radically different. He starts washing feet, caring for the hopeless and ultimately through his sacrificial death he changes everything. Our motives begin to shift. We actually begin to lay down our own self-interest to pursue something much bigger than ourselves, and we actually begin to see a world in tremendous need. The reality of this world is that God is just and the world is unjust. And the Creator from Adam to Noah to now is still scouring the earth looking for one man or one woman that can actually see past their own nose to see a world that's in desperate need and do something about it. Not much different than our world today, if you put it in the biblical frame. And notice what was the logical response. We have not been saved to do what has been drilled into our head. The so-called American dream we have been drilled from we hunt is the whole reason why we're here on this planet is to go to school, to get an education, to get a good job. <clears throat> and a good job is one that's defined as making a lot of money. And the reason why you make a lot of money is so you can buy a bunch of things that nobody needs to impress people who you don't even know who in the end don't even care. And then somehow, some way, you make it and tiptoe through death safely and go to hell. That's not what God has saved us for. We're living in Noah's day again. The wickedness might have different clothes, but it's still here today. But God has called us in this time of coming judgment to be faithful preachers of righteousness. And don't miss the task at hand. Our job is to, in love, let people know you better get in the boat because judgment's coming. And you don't want to be left behind. May we be those people here at Sunrise. Amen? Let's pray. Well, hi, this is Pastor Billy Crone of Sunrise Baptist Church and Get a Life Ministries. And I hope you enjoyed today's study. But in closing, before you go, let me ask you one final question. If you were to die today, are you sure that you go to heaven and not hell? You see, here's the problem. The Bible says that nobody automatically gets to go to heaven, and that's because God is holy and we are not. The Bible says that the wages of our sin or our unholiness or the wrong things that we have done have separated us from God. And the wages of our sin or unholiness uh, means that we deserve to die and receive God's judgment to go to hell and not heaven. In other words, we're disqualified for heaven. And that's because God being holy and us being not, the two cannot mix. So what are we going to do? Well, that's bad enough. The other problem is we don't even want to admit this dilemma, even though God already knows it all. And so out of love, God gave us something called the Ten Commandments to show us that we're really disqualified for heaven. We're not holy. We're not perfect like him. Uh, let's take a, a look at just a few of those uh, here today. Uh, the Bible says, the Ten Commandments says, you shall not bear false witness. That means lying. How many of you have ever told a lie before? Well, those of you who didn't raise your hand, you just did. Okay, let's be honest, folks. Let's not tell another lie. We've all lied. Well, believe it or not, that disqualifies you for heaven. That's how holy God is. He is the truth. He does not lie. And so that makes us a liar. Another of the Ten Commandments says you shall not steal, okay? How many have ever taken anything without permission? Well, all of our hands should have went up at that one. Uh, we've already said we're a bunch of liars, okay? Well, we've all done that, and it doesn't have to be a bank. Uh, it could be a pencil in the third grade. Uh, that means that we're a thief, okay? The Bible says that God is so holy, even his name is holy, and that's why one of the Ten Commandments says you shall not use the Lord's name in vain, Hey, folks, isn't it ironic how uh, now the blessed name of Jesus Christ, the Bible says there's no other name under heaven by which men might be saved, Jesus Christ, has now become a cuss word? Folks, the Bible says that's the sin of blasphemy, okay? And folks, let's be honest, we've used God's name in vain uh, before. 
The Bible also says in the Ten Commandments, you shall not commit adultery. And Jesus takes the standard even higher. He says, listen, it's not just physical adultery. He says, surely I tell you that if you look at another person with lust in your eye, you've committed adultery in your heart. God looks at the heart. One more out of the Ten Commandments says, you shall not murder. And you might say, well, hey, I haven't done that one. Really? The Bible says that the sin of hatred is akin to the sin of murder. You, in other words, in your heart, wish they were dead. You pull the trigger, if you will, in your own heart. And the Bible says God sees that, and it's just as bad. He knows the mind. He knows the hearts, the thoughts, and the intents that we have. Folks, that's just five out of the Ten Commandments. How are you doing? Not very well. None of us can keep them. They're God's x-ray to show us that we're disqualified. And so when, not if, your time comes, because we're all marching towards the grave at different speeds, you're going to have to stand before God, and you're going to have to uh, say who you really are. He already knows. Hey, God, let me into heaven. Uh, I'm, I'm a liar. I'm a thief. I'm a blasphemer, adulterer, and a murderer. Folks, the Bible is clear. Such people as these will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. That's the problem. Here's the good news. God so loved the world that he sent his one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him, what he did on the cross, on our behalf, that we will not perish, we will not go to hell, but he will give us the gift of eternal life. Jesus died on the cross to forgive us of all of our sins. It's something that we don't earn, we, we, we can't earn. It's a gift, the Bible calls it, and a gift cannot be earned. He was taking the death penalty in our place. That's what the cross was of the day. And that if we would just ask Jesus Christ to forgive us of our sins and believe that in our heart that God raised him from the grave, showing that his death is satisfactory to God to forgive us of all of our sins, no matter what we've done, the Bible says we shall be saved. Uh, the Apostle Paul says that if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the grave, we will be saved. Let me give you a common analogy of what God's doing and what he did for us with Jesus dying on the cross on our behalf. Uh, in life, we know that people uh, can be sentenced for a crime uh, to where they're actually on death row. Uh, the courtroom scene has completely finished. The gavel has already sounded. Uh, they are going to jail and they're just awaiting their time before they go to the death penalty. Uh, as they're sitting there in the jail cell, uh, it, it's a proven fact they did what they did. Everybody knows it. They're just waiting for that time for their uh, number to come up, so to speak, and walk down that hall and be executed. Uh, there's nothing they could do to reverse their crime. No amount of good works in that jail cell can reverse what they've done. It's too late. It's over. But believe it or not, there's one way that people even today can get off a of death row. And that's if the one in authority, the governor, if he were to, out of mercy and kindness, nothing that the person did, because they don't earn it and they don't deserve it, and they can't earn it, if he would grant them what's called a pardon, out of the kindness of his heart, he has the authority to grant them a pardon and absolve them completely of their crimes uh, against the state. And did you know that there's actually been people that this has happened to, that the governor, out of mercy, has granted them a pardon as a gift, and they've gone down to the jail cell, and handed that person, extended it through the bars, here, I'm granting you a pardon. If you would just receive it, you can go free right now. And did you know that there's actually been people who've said, no, I don't want your pardon. And so what happened is of their own doing, even though they had a way out, they still had to go to the death penalty. Folks, can I tell you something? That's what God did for us with Jesus dying on the cross. He sent his son to take the death penalty in our place. He, God, has the authority to grant us through Jesus a complete pardon. And every day that you're still alive, God is extending to you spiritually this pardon. But a pardon does you no good unless you reach out and receive it by faith. Won't you do that today? Won't you call upon the name of Jesus Christ? Ask him, to forgive you of all of your sins, to trust in his work on the cross, to pardon us from all of our crimes, our sins against God. God loves you. He wants a relationship with you. But there's only one way to heaven. It's Jesus. There's only one way to get off a of death row. It's through the cross of Jesus Christ. Won't you do that right now? 
Well, this has been Pastor Billy Crone of Sunrise Baptist Church and, and Get a Life Ministries. And if there's anything that we can do for you, uh, please don't hesitate uh, to contact us. Uh, our number, our information will uh, come up here on the screen shortly. And uh, uh, if there's anything we could do for you, please don't hesitate to let us know. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us. And uh, remember, I hope to see you in heaven. God bless. Thank you for watching this presentation from Sunrise Baptist Church. If you would like to send us a letter or any other kind of postage, you can reach us at 1780 Betty Lane, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89156. For more information, you can give us a call at 702-452-8599 or email us at bcrone at getalifemedia.com or you can visit our website at www.getalifemedia.com. Billy Crone and this ministry can also be found on Facebook and Twitter. Join us for services at www.sunriselv.com.